Hi, I'm Craig Rowe and I'll be showing you around HMS Victory, which, believe it or not, is almost 250 years old and still officially in service with the Royal Navy. Later, I'll be joined by Peter Goodwin, curator and naval historian. But first, let's find out more about the ship's history. Here it is, a beautifully restored living reminder of life on board a Georgian warship. The victory you see before you has been restored to her fighting condition, which shows us how she would have looked at the time of Trafalgar. Now for our tour, we begin at the stern of the upper gun deck, where we find the great cabins. This is the most luxurious part of the ship, and also the place where successive admirals would have planned their battle strategies. Come with me and I'll show you round. This cabin is where Lord Nelson worked, dined and slept. Nelson became one of the greatest naval heroes of all time. Previous successes meant he was admired throughout England and was famously known for his ability to inspire men of the highest rank as well as the lowest. This uniform coat is a replica of the one that Nelson wore when he was shot at the Battle of Trafalgar. Now, by today's standards, he wasn't a tall man at all, just five feet six. When the ship went into battle, this cabin became part of the upper gun deck and all the furniture and fittings had to be removed to allow the gunners to do their work. Now, let's go one deck up because directly above the day cabin is the captain's accommodation. Now this cabin was used by Captain Hardy, who, like Nelson, had separate day, dining and bed space. And it was actually Captain Hardy, not Nelson, who commanded HMS Victory during the Battle of Trafalgar. I'm now joined by Peter Goodwin, who's going to tell us more about how the Battle of Trafalgar unfolded. Now Peter, what was it like up here during the battle? Being a very open deck, it was quite horrendous actually because while you're standing here going into the battle, there'll be shots screaming and droning through the air, ripping through the rigging and slamming into the masts. And as each gun fired, the flame out from the vents would, would, would scorch the beams overhead and fill the whole of the gun decks with a thick, acrid sulfur smoke in which these men had to be working in. Gosh, and also I'm just thinking as well, it must have been really loud. Immensely, immensely. It is reported that the battle could be heard 60 miles inland in Spain. Now, believe it or not, more men died from disease than from battle wounds. For every one man who died in battle, nearly 40 died from disease. Now, scurvy was a huge problem due to the lack of vitamin C in the men's diets. So they were encouraged to eat lots of citrus fruits like oranges, lemons and limes, which is how the British sailors earned their nickname as limes. Mind you, being treated here wouldn't have been much fun, as back then, medicines equated to basic herbal remedies. There was no anaesthetic, and the only antiseptic was salt rubbed painfully into wounds to prevent gangrene. Soup was available from the galley, and it was poured out as a jelly-like broth that was easy to carry. Ugh. Let's go through to the upper gun deck. Now, you may be wondering, how would a ship as large and as old as this have raised its anchors? Well, I'll tell you, manpower. It was a major task to raise the anchors on board Victory, as each anchor weighed four tons and the cables weighed six and a half tons. Now, this all had to be carried out manually using two capstans mounted in the centre of the ship that were joined vertically. One capstan had a total of 12 bars, the other had 14 bars. So each bar had space for 10 men, so in total, 260 men on two levels were used to raise the anchor. Now, after all that hard work, ugh, men on board Victory would have expected a good hearty meal at the end of the day. Which brings us on to the next part of the ship, the galley, where all the food was prepared. This is located at the forward end of this deck. I'm now standing in the very bowels of the ship. Now here at the bottom of the hold, there were blocks of heavy pig iron covered in a layer of shingle. Now this served as a ballast to counteract the weight of the guns and the mast above. When fully stored, the hold contained enough provisions to last the ship and crew six months of sailing. There were barrels filled with salted beef, 
pork, fish and water, and then sacks of dried provisions such as oats, biscuits, peas and pulses, and casks with butter and cheese. Now the biggest problem down here in the hold was rats. They would come on board in sacks of dried vegetables and they would have to be dealt with quickly before they bred out of control. In times of battle, the after cockpit was transformed into a casualty theatre, where below the ship's waterline and safe from the effects of gunfire, the surgeon and his mate would deal with all types of injuries caused by shot, splinters, sharp edged weapons and burns. A good surgeon could amputate an arm or a leg in one and a half minutes. During the Battle of Trafalgar, there were five amputations of arms and legs and seven more afterwards. Sadly, it was also on this deck that Lord Nelson passed away. He drifted in and out of consciousness and on two occasions called for Captain Hardy. The first was to ask, how goes the battle, Hardy? The reply was, my lord, you have won the day. Nelson then uttered, thank God I have done my duty. Now it's impossible to predict what Great Britain would have been like if Napoleon had not been defeated. We do know however that the victories of Trafalgar and Waterloo in 1815 secured Britain's freedom for over a century as well as our domination of the seas. Now looking at victory today I'm sure you'll agree that whilst the age of sail has long passed her strength and beauty captures forever the golden age of seafaring that she helped to create. Goodbye.